Nick. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this session. And I hope too many of you haven't already suffered through, through me giving a talk earlier today. One thing I'm not going to do is talk about CITES, so that's a, that's a bit of a relief to me, if not to you. I'm going to talk about some of the other options that are available to us for improving the conservation and management status of sharks. Now, I'm also probably going to, to skim over a lot of points that other speakers are just about to cover in a lot more detail. So forgive me if I make a few sweeping statements and sweeping assumptions. Um, hopefully, some of you will come along later and justify them. But, so this is my particular view of the world. And my view of the world, where it deals with sharks and their relatives, is that we have inadequate management. Almost everywhere, we have inadequate management of fisheries, of trade, and of critical habitat. What this does is lead to unsustainable rates of exploitation and population depletion. So the work that Nick just referred to on red list assessments has looked at the rate of population depletion in very large numbers of, of um, shark species. And this is the biggest challenge, as I feel, we have today. And one of the problems, one of the, the issues that is creating this are the constraints upon fisheries management and fisheries managers. Now, shark fisheries are difficult to manage. I'm not going to explain why. I'm not going to go into the biological constraints, the fact that sharks have very low intrinsic rate of population increase. I'm just going to tell you here and now, for the purposes of this talk, trust me, shark fisheries are difficult to manage. They are also a problem because landings are often low volume and low value. That first point of landing. Of course, the trade in shark fins is very high value, and a few species have high value meat. But compared with other important commercial species, cod, rockfish, tuna, sharks are very low value. Furthermore, they're often a bycatch or a byproduct or a secondary target, whatever you want to talk, call them, but they're often not the target that fishermen go out and catch, and that makes them even more difficult. What all of this means is that if you're a fisheries manager with limited resources, other fisheries are going to have much higher management priority for you. And that's entirely understandable. Most fisheries departments have some very major resource and human capacity obstacles to setting up um, programs for managing shark fisheries. And of course, there are notable exceptions to my whole series of sweeping statements here. US. Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. There are, there are some really nicely managed shark fisheries out there, but on the whole, most places in the world, there aren't. Consequences of these issues. Now, someone, David's going to tell you about the IPOA sharks. Um, this is the FAO, International Plan of Action for the Conservation and Management of Sharks, which was um, set up, or rather agreed, over 10 years ago, um, when CITES frightened people into the bit. Um, and it was going to be the answer to depleted shark stocks, the answers to unmanaged fisheries. But I'm afraid, again, a sweeping statement from me, it has failed to deliver improved fisheries management in most parts of the world. Um, however, the very existence of the IPOA has combined with political interest to delay quite a bit of the progress within certain biodiversity conventions, actually within CITES particularly. But we've been talking about CITES for several hours already today, so. I said I'm not going to go there. But the point I would like to make is that they're really, based on the history of shark conservation and management over the past decade or so, there is no justification for leaving shark management solely to the fisheries managers. We certainly need fisheries management. It's absolutely essential to get shark conservation moving. But we also have to look at the other tools in the toolbox. So that is what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the biodiversity conservation um, opportunities which provide an alternative approach to achieving improved shark conservation and management. Um, these are the MEAs, the Multilateral Environmental Agreements. I'm not going to use those words again. MEAs. Um, CITES, Convention on International Trade, is the one we've already put a, a lot of attention to today, so I'm never going to mention that again now. Be assured. I am, however, going to talk about the the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species, and I'm going to talk about a couple of the regional seas agreements that I'm more familiar with. There are lots more, 
I'm not going to talk about CBD, the conservation, con sorry, Convention on Biological Diversity, although some countries are certainly producing national biodiversity <coughs> action plans within this framework. I'm not going to talk about the Bern Convention or the ASEAN Agreement on the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. Um, these lists are just here to let you know that within your backyard there may be other MEAs that could be used to promote the conservation and management of sharks. So there are lots more, but time is limited. Lots of people want to talk, so I'm just going to focus very quickly on the very few. And after CITES, my favorite is CMS, the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species. Uh, a few years ago, the Shark Specialist Group actually did a review for CMS, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, CMS was set up because it was recognized that countries had to cooperate in the conservation of animals that migrate across national boundaries. It's done some really good work, work with birds. We have bird flyways to migrate <coughs> birds, and, and within CMS, countries have got together to protect important stopping areas along the flyways of birds and thus to secure the conservation of populations which could not be conserved by a single country working on <coughs> We also have had some very good work by CMS on cetaceans, small cetaceans in the North Sea and Baltic, sorry, in the Black Sea, the North Sea and Baltic, um, small cetaceans in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Sea turtles also have received attention from CMS because these are all <coughs> shared wildlife stocks. Now, there are two main bits to, to CMS, and one is Appendix 1, which is where you put your endangered species. Um, any animal that is listed on Appendix 1 should then receive strict protection from the parties to this convention. And then Appendix 2 has got a much longer title. It's Species with an Unfavorable Conservation Status for which Conservation and Management is Required, uh, or Agreements are Needed. Um, one of those agreements, which has only recently been developed, have only recently been signed, and therefore come into force, is the Sharp Memorandum of Understanding. So we actually now have a framework within CMS for the conservation and management of sharks. And we have countries already signed up to that, and a lot more who are going to sign. Now, unlike CITES, CMS does not have such a very large um, complement of parties, a large complement of members. However, CMS is different to CITES in that anyone can come and play with the MOU. They're quite happy to have countries that are not party to the whole convention come along and sign up to the MOU and start um, joining in with actions for, for these species with an unfavorable conservation status. So remember <coughs> CMS, remember the Sharp MOU. It doesn't matter if your country or the country where you may be doing the search is not a party to the convention they can still take part. That's very important. Now, this is the review of migratory chondrichthyum fisheries which we, we undertook a few years ago for CMS, and you can download this from the Shark Specialist Group website. And don't worry, I don't expect you to read that. Um, however, what we did was we, we produced a database, and we looked at all of the species that we considered were migratory or possibly migratory, and we looked at their red list status. Um, and this information is in the report. Do, do have a look at it if you're interested. But the main result of this was that the CMS <coughs> Scientific Council looked at this, and they agreed that, yes, in principle, migratory species that are also threatened qualify for listing in the appendices of CMS. And at the moment, we only have a small number of species listed, but there is scope for listing many more. And there is a discussion still to take place on whether the SHARP MOU will include species that are listed, or only some of the species that are listed, or maybe even species that aren't listed. But we do have a really important opportunity here for developing SHARP conservation and management actions with this convention. So, 140 species on the database. This was 14% of all the chondrichthyans. That's a lot of animals. We, there may, in fact, be more than that, um, which will turn out to be migratory, but we have a lot of data deficient species. Um, what we also found, though, by looking at this, was that, in fact, there is a higher level of risk for 
migratory species than for other species. So this convention is going to be important. And of course, we also have a, a whole sort of a gray area of species that may possibly be migratory, which were assessed on the red list as data deficient. And the reason they're data deficient is obviously because we don't know enough about them. We don't know enough about them to know whether they're threatened or indeed whether they migrate. So there's still a lot of work to do there. Right, moving on quickly, I'm, I'm only going to focus on <coughs> this now, which is the Network of Regional Seas Conventions. And you can find links to these conventions and this map from the UNEP website. Uh, there are 18 areas of the world which are covered by these conventions. Some of them are administered by UNEP itself, and some of them are completely independent. Most of them have action plans which are adopted by their member countries and they function through the action plan. And it's possible to download those, or should at least be possible to download those action plans from each of the regional seas websites. But a large number of them also have legally binding conventions, which is of course very important. So here's one. This is the Mediterranean, the Barcelona Convention for the Conservation of the Mediterranean, which has a particular protocol concerning um, protected areas and biological diversity. This is in addition to the protocols on, for example, pollution, which most of these seas have. Um, the Barcelona Protocol has three annexes. The first one deals with habitats. Annex two lists endangered or threatened species. And in theory, at least, once a species is on Annex two of this convention, all of the countries that are signed up should give it full protection. In practice, that has not yet happened. We only have a small number of Mediterranean states that are protecting animals like the devil ray and the basking shark, but in theory, they all should do that. Then in Annex 3 is species whose exploitation is regulated, and I think that's probably rather an aspirational, um, than, uh, more of an aspirational <coughs> annex than an actual one, but it, it's pointing in the right direction. And there is now a large number of lasso-branks on these lists. The um, Barcelona Convention has also got an action plan for the conservation of the cartilaginous fisheries in the Mediterranean Sea on the website. And it has developed <coughs> guidelines to design regulations for the conservation and management of sharks. So it's starting to think about how to deal with these species on Appendix 2. Um, OSPAR is the convention for the Northeast Atlantic. And it's the sort of son of the Oslo Convention and the Paris Convention. That's why it has this strange name. It also has a list of threatened and declining species. You can, you can get to this list. This is just a snapshot of it um, from the website. And if you click on any one of those species, you will go straight through to the action document for that. So the website will link straight through to the background document for, in this case, the basking shark. But you will have find at the back there a list of actions, a list of monitoring objectives and of actions which all of the countries have signed up to. It's important. So my conclusion is this. Look at other options for developing shark conservation and management actions. Many of these are regional. Some are for particular groups like the migratory sharks. And coming up in the next few years, well, we have a CMS conference this year, so we're almost too late now to get anything listed there, but I presume another one will come along behind it in 2014. And between the conferences, there are these intersessional meetings of the Scientific Council which considers migratory species issues. This is something for scientists to get involved in. Oops, I said I wouldn't say the CITES word again. Sorry, I just have. <laughs> Sorry about that. But there is a CITES conference coming up in 2013. And before that, we also have intersessional meetings of the Animals Committee. And this has been talked out a lot in the last few hours. It's another thing for scientists to become involved in. And finally, look at your nearest regional seas programs and see whether you can get a bit of action moving there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.